I remember one day I was flying from Nice to London and uh, I had a lovely lady sitting on my left and I started uh, having a conversation with her and said, okay, what, what do you do for a living? And she said, I'm an evangelist. I said, no way. <laughs> That's really rare breed. And she said, indeed. <laughs> and said, so what's, what's, what's your good news? And she said, I'm working for IBM as an evangelist and I'm pioneering uh, artificial intelligence uh, down there in Sophia Antipolis. I said, that's wonderful. And so you're an evangelist for IBM. I said, the first time I met an evangelist for IBM. I said, yeah, yes, yeah, great news, great news indeed. So what do you do for a living? I said, I'm an evangelist too. I said, no way. I never met you in IBM. I said, not, not, not the same company. I said, who do you work for? I said, the Church of Jesus Christ. And that was it. Silence radio all the way down to London. I lost my confidence as an evangelist. <laughs> Suddenly, I was no longer good news. <laughs> Let's face it. If we, if we must grow confident with our witness, it's precisely because we do not feel confident that people around us won't want to listen to what we have to say. Will they even understand what we're talking about? What is actually an evangelist? according to the Bible. And so this morning, I want us to look at a confident witness. And his name is Philip. And I'd like us to look at the story of Philip sharing his passion about Jesus to a very skeptic Nathaniel that very much like look as an obnoxious French guy. And that, I think, is a parable for today. Philip versus Nathaniel, the evangelist, confident in his witness, versus the very skeptic French Nathaniel. And that's what we're going to look at today. I'm just turning to Patrick. Is my sound okay? Yeah, I think so. Okay? All right. So I want to review the story together. It's found in the Gospel of John, so if you have a copy of scriptures, John chapter 1. And I'll start with uh, verse 43 all the way to 48, and then we'll, uh, we'll look at it about the passage, and then we'll continue to read it further on. So John chapter 1, verse 43, and on. Let's just pray. Father, this is uh, your word, and as we approach your word, we pray, give us a heart for your word and a word for our hearts, Father. Bless the scriptures and the reading. Amen. John 1, starting verse 43. The next day Jesus decided to go to Galilee. And he found Philip and he said to him, Follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. And so Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? And Philip said to him, Well, come and see. So Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said to him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? And Jesus answered him, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. And so I want to start by looking at Nathaniel, the skeptic, and the three marks that define him. The story of Nathaniel starts, according to the scriptures, as Nathaniel sitting under a fig tree and being alone. We do not know really exactly what uh, Nathaniel is thinking under his lonely fig tree. We do not know what he's thinking about. Maybe he's thinking about the existential question like uh, the cosmological argument. You know, where is the universe is coming from? Or the theological argument, where are we going? Or maybe he's, he's thinking, did, did my wife really lock the door when we left this morning for church? <laughs> or, you know, what is it for lunch? You know, deep existential questions. And so Nathaniel is, is, is just under the tree, and he's alone, again, says the text, 
and he's looking at life, and out there, under his tree, he's reading his own worldview. Now you may ask, what is a worldview? That's a great question. Well, a worldview is a view of the world. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I'm glad you're really happy you came this morning. I'm drawing a new world. A worldview is a view of the world which takes origin in what you can see. It's a view of the world. So through what the eyes can see, you define what is reality out there. It's an attempt to define reality using yourself, your eyes, as a starting point. And that's the first mark of the secular man, Nathaniel, individualism. It starts with me as the reference point and what I can see. I want you to take notice. For the individualist, what is real is what I can see. Therefore, if I cannot see, it's not real. You understand that? If I cannot see that with my own eyes, it's outside of my worldview, therefore it's not. It's not there. It doesn't exist. I worked for a um, couple of years for uh, the Michelin Corporation. And I remember uh, there was a, a colleague of mine called Patrice. And he was... Uh, very individualistic, very skeptic, very Nathaniel, very obnoxious. <laughs> I remember uh, one of those uh, evenings where he invited uh, uh, a lot of the interns uh, and the French engineers, and we were having a lovely conversation, and at some point it came on the matter of faith, and Patrice was a forceful atheist. He was very convinced that God was not there. And so he would just very loudly expose his worldview, his view of the world, and of course it created sort of a tension because everybody knew that uh, as I was working for Michelin, I was also a seminary student. And the more he grew louder, the more people were actually embarrassed about the whole situation. And then suddenly he went very quiet and all eyes turned around me. And I said to Patrice, I said, I'm hearing you talk about someone that you seem to know a lot of. And he said, well, I'm not the one actually who is in trouble. You are in trouble. I said, how so? I said, well, you are right now devoting your life to study theology, study a God who is not there. <laughs> you are in deep trouble. I'm working with rubber every day. I can taste it. I can feel it. I can touch it. So, well, I can feel and I can touch God from where I am. I think the problem is that from your vantage point, you can't see God. But if we su just switch seats, you will see that from my vantage point, God is very real. And I can see Him. And He said, I dare you to switch seats. I said, whenever you want, man. <laughs> And so the very next morning, we started Bible studies at the Waffle House. Seven o'clock before clocking in. And we unwrapped the scriptures so that he could see the God that he could not see from his own worldview. The first mark of the secular man today is that he's an individualist who is forming his own worldview, and if he cannot see it, it's not real. What do you see this morning? Do you see the heavens open? Do you see the angels worshipping with us? Just because you can't see them doesn't mean it's not real. Then the story continues. Philip comes. And he says to Nathaniel, we found the Messiah, the one that Moses announced through the prophets, the one we are to listen to. He is Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Philip is very confident. 
And Nathaniel answers back and says, Nazareth? Seriously? Can anything good come out of Nazareth? I mean, to put that in the context, it would be like you saying to your neighbor, hey, I have met God, and guess what? He lives in roquefort les pins <laughs> Now that make you laugh. This is a bit cynical, because you're like, roquefort les pins Yeah, I know where it is. It's about 200 people. Okay. Wow. I mean, if God lives in roquefort les pins yeah, wow, good chance. <laughs> All right. See, the modern man is cynical. That's the second slide. <laughs> what is cynicism? Well, cynicism is more than skepticism. See, because the skeptic doesn't know if it is true or not. That's why he's skeptic. He's debating, is it true or not? Is it possible that actually God lives in Nazareth? Now, the cynic, he knows it cannot be true. Why? Because he doesn't want it to be true. He has already made it his mind. You don't need to bring any proof. And actually with the cynic, the more proof you bring to the table, the less actually he believes. We had a, a neighbor back when we were living in Touraine, planting a church down there. And Touraine is, a, is the heart of a social radicalism, is the heart of a Freemasonry. It's quite tough ground. And we minister in that place for 15 years, surrounded with a lot of cynical people. And my neighbor was just an epiphany. And I remember one day we were uh, chatting and he was like, oh, did you see, by the way, this, uh, this documentary on Arte? And whenever, whenever someone is quoting Arte, you know you're in deep trouble as a Christian. Because <laughs> they have a strong cynical agenda against Christianity. He said, they were talking about how the Bible was actually abused through the years, so that actually what the church wanted to be in there was in there. It was basically a sort of a big complot from the Vatican, and, and it was driven by Opus, Opus Dei. I'm like, wow. Um, well, uh, I think there's another story out there. And he said, no, 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 no that's the official story. Said, I'm not sure. And so I rushed back in my office, and I brought my New Testament in Greek. I said, this is the original text. And he was like, oh, wow, that's, that's brutal. <laughs> are you saying that these are the original words that Jesus wrote? I said, no, but I mean, this is the text that was, that was written by the disciples. And so how do you know it's true? Well, then I went into textual criticism and I showed him variations of the text in a papyri, you know, and, and I said, well, those are the variations that we know, the kind of variations are in the, in the text and then we can reconcile. And I could see in his eyes that the more argument I was putting on the table, the more concerned he was about my own sanity. <laughs> And at some point, I had to stop, because he was counterproductive. And I looked at him and said, now you are scared that I am mad, that I lost my sanity. And then you're thinking to yourself, this guy has four kids, and they're all growing up in a cult. Is that what is going on through your mind right now? And he looked at me and said, exactly. And I said, I am sure that you are thinking, should I call the assistant social? <laughs> I said, I'm just about to do it. You see the difference between skepticism and cynicism? That's the second mark of the second man out there. The one that uh, you're trying to reach, your neighbor, <laughs> maybe a family member. Are you cynic? Have you decided this morning that you will believe, not based on truth, but what you wish were true? What you really want to be true? 
Are you worshiping Him, the Lord of hosts, this morning? With the angels and the heavens open. It's really hard to witness to people who are cynical and who tend to get offended very quickly that Philip doesn't seem to worry too much about what Nathaniel thinks of him. He's not scared that Nathaniel will die 911 and say, I think there's a crazy guy out there who thinks that actually the Messiah lives in Nazareth. He's not offended by it. He doesn't take it personally. He turns around to Nathaniel and says, well, come and see for yourself. In other words, Philip remembers that the third mark of the secular man is pragmatism. And that's the other slide. Pragmatism. The secular man must see, he must feel, and he must experience it for himself. Otherwise, he will not believe it. It has to be in concreto. And this is exactly what Philip is offering him. Come and see. Come and experience it for yourself. Philip remembers, I believe, a quote by the late Leslie Newbigin, who once said, skepticism is not the active principle in the advance of knowledge. The active principle is the willingness to go out beyond what is certain, to listen to what is not yet clear, and to search for what is hardly visible, to venture the affirmation which may prove to be wrong, but also which may also prove to be the starting point for new conquests of the mind. And so in the traditional language of Christianity, the name of that active principle is faith. When I challenged my colleague Patrice to start a journey, he quickly discovered that what he thought was wrong actually was true. But he had to go through the experience himself. He would not believe it otherwise. Have you experienced life to the full in Jesus? Are you willing this morning to go beyond what you believe is certain, to listen to what is not yet clear, to search for what is hardly visible? This morning can be the starting point for new conquest, my friend. Jesus calls us to greater things. And so Nathaniel, the secular man, starts the journey, the journey of faith towards Jesus of Nazareth. So the passage continues, and we pick up in scriptures. Again, John 1, starting 47. Jesus saw Nathaniel coming toward him and said of him, Behold, an Israelite, indeed, in whom there is no deceit. And Nathaniel said to him, how do you know me? And Jesus answered him, Well, before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. And Nathaniel answered him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. And Jesus answered him, Because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, you believe? But you will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. What a surprise. What a surprise when Nathaniel hears Jesus say to him, Before Philip called you, I saw you. As if Jesus was saying, Nathaniel, you think that you see everything from where you're standing. But you don't. The world is not limited to what you can see. Where I stand, I see you even though you do not see me. And I've always seen you. And now is the time for you to come and see me. What a surprise when Nathaniel hears Jesus say, Behold, an Israelite, in, the, in whom there is no deceit. And he answered, How do you know me? 
How do you know me? As Jesus was saying, Nathaniel, you think that you know everything. But you don't. Where I stand, I see you and I know you. I've always known you. And now is the time for you to come and know me. And what a surprise when Nathaniel hears Jesus say to him, Because I say to you, I saw you under the fig tree, you believe. Now you will see greater things than these. Come and follow me. As if Jesus was saying, Nathaniel, you think that you have lived through everything, but you have not. There is more to life. And I call you today to experience greater things. It is time for you now to come and follow me. What a surprise, Nathaniel. I see you, I know you, and I call you to follow me. And the next slide. In other words, to the individualist who say, unless I see it, and to the cynic who says, unless I know it, and to the pragmatist who say, unless I experience it, Jesus say, I see you, I know you, and I call you. Now just come and follow me. You see how Jesus is anticipating the questions of the second man. And how he's engaging through him. Are you confident in your witness this morning? When faced with individualism and cynicism and pragmatism, our confidence level sinks to the bottom. And then I'm here on the airplane sitting next to this evangelist from IBM and I said, and Jesus, can't you see the situation? Don't you know what's happening? Why don't you call this evangelist of IBM to become your evangelist? And suddenly I become Nathaniel. Behold a worshipper in whom there is no deceit. How gracious is Jesus. He can work with me, a non-confident witness, who doubt that he sees and he knows and he calls people still today. And he wants to use me to reach out to my family, to my neighbors, my colleagues, no matter how deep they are in game, in secularism. So my friend, stay confident, stay confident in your witness. Jesus is still the answer and the hope for this world. I would like now maybe to take an opportunity for you just to quiet down and think about first the Nathaniels around you. Those who are deep in individualism, in cynicism, in pragmatism. Maybe now you can see their face. You know their name. Maybe now give you a time to pray for them. And even why not, out loud, say their first name so that we can join you and pray for them. Let's do that now. Just take a time, a corporate time, to call on upon the Lord for those men and women that we know of who still need to know and see and experience the love of God. And again, if you want to just shout out their first name, we'll join you and pray. And say, yes, Lord, you see them, you know them, and you call them today. Let's do that now.